first, actually, I know there's a lot of professional photographers out here, but I'm going to get a quick selfie. So everybody cheer. Some of y'all might think that was an elaborate scheme to uh, show you that I'm still using an iPhone SE. <laughs> Thank you for noticing. <laughs> Today I'm here to talk to you about an opportunity of a lifetime. There's a unique opportunity that nobody in the financial space is talking about. You can make incredible amounts of money, you can work on your own terms, and you can make other people happy. How, you might be asking? Of course, I'm talking about selling Trump NFTs. <laughs> These are an excellent grift for anybody. <laughs> By selling this imaginary item to all your friends and family, you're going to be set for life in no time. But wait, there's more. For the CNN lovers in your life, there's also Biden NFTs. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's not what I'm here to talk to you about today. What I'm actually going to talk to you about today is how to become a lazy landlord. I know, I know, all the index fund investors in the audience, your eyes have just glazed over like a Krispy Kreme donut. I can even see it from here. But I think I make a pretty compelling argument, and you might be surprised by what you hear. First, I want to go over a couple of ground rules. Number one, this is not advice. This is for entertainment and educational purposes only. And number two, please don't take anything I say too seriously because we're all living in a simulation anyway, and none of this is real. <laughs> You've been warned. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and how I ended up on this stage in front of you. So I am a CODA. That means I'm a child of deaf adults. And ultimately, what that means is that my sisters and I grew up in a very different household than most of you. In elementary school, we were calling and setting our own doctor's appointments and negotiating car sales. It wasn't all bad, though. My first CD was a Tupac CD when I was in the third grade. I got to listen to music as loud as I wanted to growing up. And it was incredibly easy for me to sneak out as a teenager. <laughs> I did grow up in a single parent household. So my parents divorced when I was really young and my dad ended up passing away when I was 12. So we had a pretty humble upbringing and that created a chip on my shoulder. I was born and raised in Alabama. I know more than a few of you are surprised to see me wearing shoes up here today. I'm happy to let you know that we always wore shoes to school and to church, and that we almost always had running water. <laughs> there was a couple years growing up that there was a leak under the slab of our house, and we didn't have the money to have it fixed. So we would have to walk out to the road and cut the water on when we needed to shower, wash dishes, or go to the bathroom. And we always had to remember to go and cut it off, because otherwise we wouldn't have enough money for the bill. Now, I know you may look up here and think, man, this guy's got shit together. So you might be surprised to hear that I am the three-time recipient of You Could Do Better. <laughs> three different girls I dated, their parents told them they could do better than me. One even had the gall to say it straight to my face. I don't know if it makes it better or worse. Like, I really haven't decided. I have no idea. I did go to a local community college. This wasn't because I was trying to game the system or anything like that. I genuinely didn't know that I could qualify for student loans, so my college experience was living at home, spending every dollar I had trying to prove I wasn't poor, which made me poorer. And that culminated at one specific moment. Does everybody know what this is? I was on a date with my now wife, and my card got declined at a red box. I didn't have a dollar fucking seven to my name. So things are going pretty well for me at this point. Luckily, she looked past that, and we got married in 2015 and began living what many would consider to be the American dream, even though we were still pretty broke. Luckily, we found Mr. My Mustache in 2016 and absolutely changed our lives. We decided to focus on real estate investing and bought our first rental property in 2017. From there, we were very aggressive with our strategy, and we retired in 2019 with 10 rental units. Thank you. You might be wondering, how aggressive were you? Well, we were once at a neighborhood restaurant with some friends, and I watched my wife get up from the table and walk back to our apartment to get a slice of cheese, because she refused to pay a dollar extra for a cheeseburger. <laughs> so we were pretty aggressive. <laughs> Since we've retired, we've traveled to 15 different countries and spent over a year traveling outside the US. 
all the while self-managing our five long-term and five short-term rentals. So that last part is what I'm going to focus on here today. I'm going to teach you how you can lazily landlord your own long-term rentals and short-term rentals. Now, I am going to go through some of this pretty quickly. So if you want these slides, you can go to rethinktheratrace.com slash economy. That way you don't have to feel like you're jotting down notes and missing all the good jokes. <laughs> so first, we're going to go over your FI goal. So in this hypothetical scenario, you make $100,000 per year. You spend $50,000 per year. Now, some of the math whizzes out here might already be ahead of us. That means that you can invest $50,000 per year. Now, who in here can't do math but is afraid to admit it? OK. I don't see a lot of hands, so I'm assuming a lot of you. Don't worry. I did the math so you don't have to. You've got three options when it comes to retiring early. You can invest in index funds. To meet your $50,000 a year spending, you need $4,166 a month. You have zero doors, which is to say zero properties. And that's going to take you approximately 13.1 years with a 50% savings rate. Option number two, you can invest in long-term rentals. If you can find properties that cash flow $250 a month, you need 17 doors, and that's going to take you approximately 6.8 years to achieve, so half the time. Or you can invest in short-term rentals. If you can find properties that cash flow $1,042 a month, you only need four doors, and that takes you less than two and a half years. So again, half the time. Now, one thing I think we can all agree on out here and that that's the index funds are passive. And real estate is mostly seen as not passive. What if I told you that in this same scenario, you could self-manage your long-term rentals for an hour a week or your short-term rentals for two hours a week, and you would have to manage those for over 200 years to make up for the time difference spent working for the passive index fund? I know what a lot of you are already thinking. Well, James, it could be passive if you just get a manager. Well, we did have a property manager twice. Once for our first long-term rental, and once for our first short-term rental. And in both scenarios, we felt like our place was being mismanaged and that our guests and tenants weren't having as good of an experience. There's also the cost. If we had a property manager, this year alone would cost us over $36,000 in management fees. That's the safe withdrawal rate of a $900,000 portfolio. So instead, we choose to work a couple hours a week and pocket all that money for ourselves. So now I'm going to peel back the layers of this onion that seems to make everybody cry. And we're going to talk about what a couple hours of work a week looks like. So first, we're going to cover the lazy landlord's long-term rental. We're going to talk about tenant screening. We'll talk about rent collection, maintenance issues, and finally, time management. So first, we're going to talk about tenant screening. The tenant screening part is the most important part of the lazy landlord strategy. You're going to need people that make life easier for you, not harder for you. So how do you do that? Well, first, by having clear requirements and having them spelled out in your listing. This is going to include the income level they need to have, the credit report that they need to have, how many people can live there, whether you're allowing pets, and of course you're going to mention that you're doing background checks and credit checks, despite Gwen's <laughs> ideas. <laughs> Next, you're going to have applicants jump through a couple of free and easy hoops. Anybody that inquires about our property, we send them over a pre-screening questionnaire, and this just asks some simple information. This simple step alone eliminates 90% of the people. Most people don't want to fill this out, and that's okay because we don't want to rent to most people. And finally, you're going to have all your showings on one day. You don't want to drive back and forth to the property five, ten times a week, showing it to one person at a time. By scheduling all your showings in one morning, you're going to save yourselves a lot of time. Our places are typically pretty small, so we schedule them in 15 to 20 minute increments. You might be surprised to hear, we've actually done this entire process while we were abroad. We were in Europe and did all this screening remotely and paid a local investor half the first month's rent to show the property. The tenant that they placed, we didn't meet until two years later when they were doing their final walkthrough to move out. And they were excellent tenants during that time. Next, we're going to talk about rent collection. You're going to use a free online property management portal that's going to allow you to collect all your rents. We use apartments.com, but we've heard good things about Avail and Stessa as well. What this is going to do is automate your rent collection so you're not having to drive around collecting cash, checks, or sexual favors for rent, <laughs> all three of which generally take your time and are unsafe. <laughs> Next, we're going to talk about maintenance issues. You're going to use the same online property management portal to field all your maintenance requests. What this is going to do is keep tenants from contacting you directly, 
by going through the portal, you can then forward it on to the appropriate maintenance issues. <laughs> you're going to outsource the repairs. Remember, you're being lazy, and you don't want to show up to these properties doing all the work. So we send everything over to our handyman first, and then from there, if he can't do it, then we pass it on to our electrician, our plumber, and whoever else it may be. A key part of this is it saves us money, and it keeps the handyman happy. So you might be wondering, James, how do I find a good handyman, a good plumber, a good electrician? We use our local real estate investors group for recommendations, but our personal favorite source is our local subreddit. People on Reddit are happy to prove how much they know, and they're going to let you know if they've ever been wronged in their life ever. <laughs> so it makes for a pretty good screening platform. The next thing you're going to do is quarterly maintenance walkthroughs. We send our handyman over to our property once a quarter, and he walks through and looks for plumbing leaks, roof leaks, change HVAC filters, and it's a benefit for the tenant because they get to have all the little nagging issues resolved that they haven't submitted a maintenance request for. Next, we're going to talk about time management. You're going to spend a couple of minutes a month tracking your expenses. This is typically pretty easy for a long-term rental because your rent is pretty consistent and your expenses, your mortgage, are pretty consistent. So the only thing you're tracking is the occasional maintenance issue. Now, unfortunately, the longest part about being a lazy landlord is you are going to turn into a real estate bro, and you're going to spend your days on social media calling the stock market a scam. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't make the rules. Now, here are a few of the top concerns for a lazy landlord. Evictions. Evictions can happen. You can do everything right and have an eviction. So one thing we suggest doing is investing in landlord-friendly states and keep in the back of your mind that you can always hire a local real estate attorney to do an eviction for you. You can also have to clog toilet at 3 a.m. For some reason, most people in here think that toilets only clog at 3 a.m. Not sure why, but in the five years of managing, we've not had a single clogged toilet. If this is a genuine concern of yours, then I suggest investing in properties with two bathrooms and two toilets. <laughs> you might also be concerned about a tenant not reporting maintenance issues for months because he was avoiding a pet fee. This happened to us. We saw a tenant walking so many dogs, I thought he was working for Rover. He looked like he was mushing just without a sled. <laughs> so when we brought up his pet fee to him, he submitted three maintenance requests that day. One was a roof leak that was dripping onto his living room floor. The second one, his kitchen sink had become detached from the plumbing and was dripping into the cabinets underneath. And number three, he was living without a bedroom door. It had come off the hinges, and he was just living without it, I guess. Had we implemented that quarterly maintenance walkthrough earlier, we could have avoided this entire scenario. Next, we're going to talk about the Lazy Landlord's short-term rental. We're going to cover guest screening, pricing, the guest experience, the check-in and out process, cleanings and maintenance, and finally, time management. Now, if it seems like this is more involvement, that's because there is. But remember, now you only have four doors. So first, let's cover guest screening. A lot of people don't know that you can actually screen guests on short-term rental platforms like Airbnb. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to have uh, requirements for guests for instant bookings. So three of the things that you can require are a verified ID, a profile photo, and a previous review from a host. Next, you're going to have security cameras. And you're going to have it spelled out in your listing. One, this is going to protect you. But also, you're going to want problem guests to see that you have cameras and move on to their next unsuspecting victim. And finally, you're going to create your own rules. So if someone doesn't meet your criteria for instant booking, typically this means that they don't have a previous review from a host. So what we do is we ask them for a photo of their ID sent directly to us after booking. We found that people are much less likely to fuck up your place if you have their legal name, their address, their date of birth, their photo, and all their information. Next, we're going to talk about pricing. Pricing can make or break your property. If your price too high, it's going to sit empty and not make you any money. If it's price too low, you're going to have problem guests and more wear and tear on your property. So you're going to use a dynamic pricing software that's going to automatically adjust your prices. When you search for a flight, a hotel, or a car rental, the price you see is dictated by the demand at that certain area at that certain time that you're looking. You're going to use the same idea for your short-term rental. The next thing you're going to do is set rules in the dynamic pricing to skew towards your ideal guest trip length and your ideal guest. So for instance, we have a place that we prefer longer term bookings on. So we have it set to where if you're searching more than 30 days out, you have to book it for at least 30 days. Now once it gets within 30 days, you can book it for as little as two. 
What this does is helps us skew toward longer trip lengths and fills in the gaps in between with no effort on our part. It's all automated through the process. And finally, you're going to be shooting for a 10% vacancy rate. The first six months that we had a short-term rental, we had three vacant nights. That's way too booked up. And that means that we were undercharging and leaving money on the table and having more wear and tear on our property. By baking in a 10% vacancy rate, you're going to ensure that you're maximizing your profit while also minimizing the wear and tear and utility rates. Next, we're going to talk about the guest experience. Your goal with the guest experience is to minimize the one-off messages as much as you can. One key part of this is answering questions before they even ask them. So you might be wondering, how do I do that? Automated messaging is one of the key factors. As soon as someone books with us, they're entered into our flow of automated messaging. This gives them all the information that they need, like the address, the check-in and out date and time, the Wi-Fi information, when to expect their next message, their checkout information, everything that they need. Another thing it includes are YouTube videos. YouTube videos are a great way to answer questions that are easily answered visually. We show people where they're going to park, how to get to the front door. We show them how to work the pull-out couch, how to adjust the thermostat, anything that's easily answered that way. Another thing we leave for every guest are local recommendations. By leaving local recommendations to every guest, we avoid this one message that's going to save you a lot of time. Any additional effort on your part, you're trying to avoid. Remember, you're lazy. Next, we're going to talk about the check-in and out process. You're going to have a smart lock that you can control remotely. You don't want to drive out there and meet these people. Don't worry, they don't want to meet you either. <laughs> the next thing you're going to do is you're going to have the code the last four digits of their phone number. There are processes that will automate this for you, but typically we find that they assign a random four-digit code. Our goal is to avoid a drunken 3 a.m. message from a guest saying that they've forgotten what their code is. People don't typically forget their phone number no matter how many slippery nipples they've had that night. <laughs> and finally, you're going to have a logbox on site. Batteries die, Wi-Fi goes down, shit happens, and trust that if there is any way that someone can lock themselves out of your place, they will find a way to. So by leaving them a key as a backup way to get in, this is going to save you a lot of effort. Next, we're going to talk about cleanings and maintenance. <laughs> we suggest paying your cleaners a five-star uh, a bonus based on every five-star review they get. This aligns your goal and the guest's goal of having the space clean, as well as the cleaner's goal of making more money. Another thing you're going to do is have them look for maintenance issues. By having your cleaners look for maintenance issues, they're the most consistent person in your property. This is going to save you time, money, and headache in the long run. And you're also going to be doing the same quarterly maintenance walkthroughs. So your handyman is going over and looking for the same things, except this time they're also changing the locks, the batteries on the lock, they're snaking drains, and they're tightening the screws on the furniture. For some reason, the screws on the beds always seem to be loose. <laughs> Next, we're going to talk about time management. So you're going to spend a few minutes a week tracking your expenses. This is a little bit more effort than the long-term rental because your income is more sporadic and you have more expenses, but still not overly difficult. You're also going to respond to reviews. Most hosts only respond to negative reviews, and that actually just makes them stand out more. By responding to every review positively, you're going to make people think that you're a hands-on host, all the while you're being a lazy piece of shit. <laughs> and finally, the longest part, you're going to spend hours a week worrying if your guests are selling or doing drugs. We happen to think that one of our favorite repeat guests is a drug dealer. So it's not the end of the world. Here are a few of the top concerns for the lazy landlord short-term rental. Parties being thrown at your place. So this starts when you select your property. We invest in small one-bed, one-bath places that typically aren't ideal for large parties. Another thing is we don't host local guests, especially over holidays. Local guests have local friends, and that's typically a requirement of a large party. Another thing you might be concerned about is a guest establishing residency. This can happen. And then you have to go through the eviction process just like you would a long-term rental, but you don't have a lease agreement in place. So this depends on your specific area. In our area, a guest can establish tenant's rights by receiving mail. So we have locked mailboxes that we don't give guests access to, and we give them instructions on the general mail delivery service through the post office. Another thing you might be concerned about is a guy not doing well at the local pro team tryouts, having a huge fight with his girlfriend, getting drunk, walking around naked outside until the cops are called on him. <laughs> this can happen. Ask me how I know. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot you can do to avoid this exact scenario. 
But keep in mind that if there are any damages, you're typically covered through the insurance program of the rental that you're going through. Warning, bullshit metaphor incoming. Proceed with caution. Well, I guess we should see what this is. So we're rolling along, lazily landlording our income sources like wheels on a bike. So currently, we're still pedaling, which is managing. But if we ever get tired, we can just put down our kickstand, which is our index funds, and chill. And to really drive this metaphor home, I got an action shot of me on my bike here. <laughs> We've made mistakes. I'm not going to stand up here and act like we haven't. The first property that we bought, we bought a fancy condo in a fancy area, and I had aspirations. When we move out, we should rent it out and become real estate investors. So what did I do to see that that could happen? I found one listed on Zillow. I didn't take into account how much it was renting for. Did I take into account how much our expenses were? Absolutely not. It turns out that had we rented that property out, we would have lost over $300 a month before any maintenance or expenses. Not a great investor. <laughs> We also made a mistake on our first family home. We had FOMO. Everybody was talking about how three-bed, two-bath houses in good school districts make the best tenants so they make the best investments. So we bought one. And then we had our first eviction. It was on the most expensive property that we've ever bought to date, and it was supposed to be the safest investment. We're not saying that those properties don't work. We're just saying they don't work for us. And finally, on our first self-managed Airbnb. We didn't know what we know now. We hosted a local guest over Halloween, and she had a seance or did some freaky sex shit in there. We don't know. There was wax in the floor everywhere. There was drugs. There was blood in the floor. There were sex toys laying around. Had we known then what we know now about the guest screening and not allowing local guests, we could have avoided this entire scenario. One important thing about all these things is that they're all firsts. We didn't let the mistakes keep us from getting started, but we also learned from them and implemented changes to keep them from happening again. That brings me to my final point. I'm here to tell you that if two regular ass people that invest in the 113th largest market in the country and never made over 100 grand individually can invest and retire the lazy landlord way and live the life of our dreams, you can do it too. Trust me, I'm nothing special. Ask all my ex-girlfriend's parents and they'll tell you you can do it better. <laughs> Thank you.